Thank you for joining us here at the Camp Lejeune area service. I know we're in a difficult time right now, a time where we're socially distancing ourselves, but we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are distancing ourselves in the Lord. So this is where we are coming together here to bring a service to you and your place of worship and your house of worship and your place of dwelling, a place where you can get together with your family and still fellowship in the Lord. So please join us today in this time, and I pray that God will speak to our minds and our hearts just as he would do as if you were here sitting right next to us. Thank you. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have a light in my soul for which long I have sought. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, into my heart, floods of joy on my soul. Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart I have ceased from my wandering and going astray Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were many are all Jesus came into my heart, into my heart, floods of joy on my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. Since Jesus came into my heart. Billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy on my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Say hey. 
chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. When you get to Mark chapter 5, look there at the first verse. Here I'm reading from the King James Version. Mark chapter 5 and verse 1 says this, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, and to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Well, I'm glad you're here with us this morning. You know, as I was thinking about this, I, I was reminded of, of a fellow that went in for an interview, and they were sort of reaching the, the end of this interview there with the human resource person. And towards the end of that, he says to this young man who was a, a fresh graduate from MIT, he says, what kind of salary were you thinking about? He says, well, I, I'd like to start out $125,000 a year. Well, depending on the benefits package, that is. He said, really? He said, well, what about, you know, what would you say to you? Five weeks of vacation a year, 14 paid holidays, full medical and dental, company matching retirement up to 50% of salary, and a, a company leased car every two years. Let's say a, a red Corvette. He says, oh my word, you have got to be kidding. He says, yeah, but you started it. Mm. So anyway, let's go ahead. You know, what we're talking about here this morning is expectations. Expectations. Now, expectations can be hopeful and they can be hurtful. Now, we are in the book of Mark, chapter 5. And we here find the story of the, the demon-possessed man living in the country known as the Gadarenes. Gadara was a city in the region of Decapolis. It was a strong fortress east of Tiberias in Scythopolis. On the top of a hill, three Roman miles from the hot springs and bath called Amatha on the bank of the Hieromax. When you do a comparison of the Bible of this story, you find it mentioned in Matthew chapter 8 as well as Luke chapter 8. Matthew now mentions two demons, but the other two mention only one. Now, had they been imposters, had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sort of came together to try to deceive the world, surely they would have gotten this correct, the amount of folks that were there. But witnesses in a court of law say that folks are often differ in important matters, provided that the main narrative coincides, their testimony is actually thought more valuable. As a matter of just my opinion, I believe that two of these disciples decided they were more focused on the man that maybe was 
a little bit more angry, a little bit more beside himself, a little bit more furious, or a little bit more difficult to manage. So as we look at this interesting story in the book of Mark, we find it is one of an incredibly interesting story. And I can't imagine, could you imagine going out and witnessing for the Lord and telling people about the Lord and then coming back and saying, and you wouldn't believe it. And then all of a sudden, 2,000 pigs ran into the water. Now that would be quite the witnessing story. That would be quite the, the thing to come back and tell people. Well, this morning, I believe you and I can have an enjoyable time witnessing for Jesus by managing our expectation in three ways. The title to this morning's message is this, Squealing for Jesus. Squealing for Jesus. Take a look at verse 35 in Mark chapter 4. Now, preachers often preach against gossip. Amen, they should. But I would venture to say that the gospel message is the best kept secret in church. Let's start by taking a look at what happened just prior to Jesus and his disciples arriving in the Gadarenes. To begin with, we see the effort, the effort. Mark chapter four, verse 35. It says, and the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. See, when it comes to being a witness, it takes effort. It doesn't just happen. Romans 10, 14, a popular verse says this, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him? of whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? So it, it comes to our understanding that the effort that somebody must be willing to go the distance, the distance. Now the Sea of Galilee was 13 miles long and eight miles wide. Jesus finishes his teaching on the coast of Galilee, located on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, and says to his disciples, let us pass over to the other side. The country of the Gadarenes was located on the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee. And no matter if it was eight miles or ten miles diagonally, cutting across the Sea of Galilee, it was some distance they were traveling. And you have to remember this. These guys didn't have a Johnson outboard motor. It wasn't just an easy trip to get across that water. It took, at the best, some wind power or a bunch of guys rowing real hard with oars. It took some effort to get across there. You know, when I think about this, to me, I think about friends of mine, the shoals. The shoals that are there in the country of Greenland. And I think about all the effort that went in and all the, the monies and the support that goes into to get them all that distance. Them leaving their families behind, them leaving their loved ones behind, them leaving all those that they care about to do what God would have them to do. And you would figure that is enough. That, that's a long distance away from what is familiar, what is comfortable to you. Surely that was enough. But Chris said, no, I, I need a boat. For what? He says, you see, when the ice thaws, I want to be able to go from fishing village to fishing village. Maybe there's only 2,000 people there in each one of those. But they still need the Lord. He was willing to go a little bit further. See, as Jesus was talking about the distance, a Roman might demand an Israelite to carry their belongings when he said, And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him to land. That's going the extra distance for man, but what about going the extra distance for Jesus? Jesus was the one that said, Let us pass over to the other side. Are you willing to go whatever distance Jesus asked you to go? Or is that too much effort? Maybe he wants you to be a missionary or to some far off distant land. But let me ask you this. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to, maybe if he's not asking you to do that. Are you willing to maybe just have a conversation with your next door neighbor? It's worth the effort. 
So we see that. Secondly, with the effort, it comes the difficulty. Look at verse 37. Verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Hey, you mark it down. You try to do something for the Lord, and you're going to face trials. You're going to face tribulations. You're going to face difficulties in your life. Something's going to happen. Maybe, maybe your friends are going to forsake you. Maybe your co-workers won't even have anything to do with you. Maybe your own family won't even want to talk to you anymore. But you remember this. When, when that difficulty comes, when, when the waves are crashing against you, remember this, that Jesus is in the ship. Amen. Amen. Jesus is in the ship. The washing machine go out. The car may not start. The lawnmower may not cut the grass. But I remember this. When you're having those difficulties in your life and it seems like it's coming against you and you don't know which way to turn, remember this, that Jesus is in the ship. Now, look at Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. Because sometimes we can think to ourselves, man, and especially now as we're talking about this time that we live in with the virus, that nobody's got it as... As bad as I do, and, and I'm not one to talk, but it's easy for us to say sometimes as we think about just where we are in this matter. Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So they make it over to the Gadarenes. They had gone through this terrible storm, this terrible time in their life. And waves are coming against them. They were in peril. They were thinking that they were going to lose their lives. They weren't really sure of all this. And they go through all that, and they finally get to the shores there. And then it says in the Bible that they took a vacation for a while. They went out to eat. They went fishing. No, it doesn't say that at all. It doesn't say that at all. No, I, I think the word over there in verse 2 was this. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately, that's the word. Immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So how long did they have before they had to deal with a man possessed of a demon? Well, it was immediate. Right off the bat. Right off the bat. That would not have been easy, but it shows you this. When you think you've got it rough, and, and then there's always somebody that, that needs your help still, that maybe has it a little bit worse. Somebody that needs Jesus. And remember this, what's worse? Being in a ship that's tossed to and fro and facing the storms of life, but you praise God you got Jesus in the ship. Or a man possessed of a demon. Later on, we find multiple demons, not just one. I mean to tell you, I, I'm glad I got Jesus in my ship. Amen? Amen? Now, it may not have been easy to bring the gospel of Jesus to the others, but the distance and the difficulty are worth the effort. See, the question is for you and I, are, are we keeping the gospel a secret, or are we squealing for Jesus? <laughs> Secondly, we see the encounter... Mark chapter 5, verse 2 again. It says, When he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man of, with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and and day he was in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now Luke, in, in its portion of this, says this, that he wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Matthew's description says he was exceeding fear so that no man might pass by that way. 
So when they encounter the man possessed of the demon, they see the desperation. The desperation. Hey, listen, the devil is a horrible master. This man was uncontrollable, inconsolable, undesirable, undressed, a cutter, a vagrant, tormented, angry, and intimidating. He was living in misery, subjected to whatever evil torment that was inside him wanted. And verse 4 of, of chapter 5 says this, Neither could any man tame him. And the people miles around knew about that. Miles around. They knew about it. And the world's methods weren't working. Chains weren't working. Fetters that go around the feet weren't working. The world's methods weren't working. None of the things that they were trying to do. He was in a desperate existence. Folks, if you're going to have an enjoyable time witnessing, you have to realize that the person you may be going to may not look like you. He may not talk like you. He may not even smell like you. He may be that guy that's down and out and, and uh, maybe he hasn't seen a shower since the last time it rained, but, but he still needs the Lord. He still needs to know about Jesus. Folks that are living in complete desperation may be the very one God calls you to go to. You know, the hardest people oftentimes are the people that live in silent desperation. And those would be the people that seem to have everything on the ball. Seem to have, they're paying their bills. You know, they're meeting those deadlines. Maybe they even go to the services on occasion. But still, without Jesus, therefore living in, in desperation. Now, I'm reminded of Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes. Born December 24th, 1905. And you've seen the movie, American business tycoon, you know, an inventor, an aviator. I mean, this guy was one of the, when he was alive, one of the richest men in the world. He died April 5th, 1976, at the age of 70 in Houston, Texas. His reclusive activities and possibly his drug use made him practically unrecognizable. His hair was excessively long. His nails were long. His toenails were long. He was emaciated. He was six foot four and weighed 90 pounds. They said when they did the, the autopsy, that he had five broken metal needles in his arm where he had been ejected himself with coating. He's using glass syringes where the needles would sort of break off easily. But it's interesting, so when, they, when, when they did the autopsy, they said, other than malnutrition and, and, his, and his kidneys being somewhat damaged, his other internal organs, his brain, and other in his heart, and things were perfectly healthy. Listen, folks, don't you see there are folks out there that are without Christ in desperation? They need to know the Lord. This is the time it was we as Christians should be stepping forward to give them that, that hope, that love, that encouragement that Christ is the answer. Next, when it comes to the encounter, we see the deliverance. This is the part I like. The demon-possessed man comes running over to Jesus, and in verse 7 says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. See, before Jesus cast out the demons, they asked him to be cast into pigs. That were on the side of the mountain. And Jesus demonstrates his power over the demons. In verse 13 it says, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now can you imagine being out there? There you are, an old pig farmer. <laughs> and you're out there and it's a beautiful day beautiful green grass I mean you're looking over there at the Sea of Galilee and how beautiful the blue that is clouds are in the sky 
Every once in a while you hear an old mama sow grunt a little bit and maybe bump a, somebody out of her way as she's trying to get just a little bit more food and grab something. And it just, you're out there and you're 2,000 pigs around and you're thinking everything's just going wonderfully. And then all of a sudden, as 2,000 pigs squeal like you've never heard them before, and then all of a sudden, not only did they squeal, 2,000 of blood-curdling squeal, now all of a sudden, those 2,000 are running towards the water and out of your eyesight. And off they go. I'll tell you what, that would be something to behold. That would be something to like, what is going on? And, and I could just imagine, the, you know, the, the craziness of what is going on around me? What is happening here? And I would imagine somewhere in there, somewhere in there, that Kermit is going, please come back to me, Miss Piggy. <laughs> oh, but listen, in the midst of this crazy commotion, there's a man whose soul that has been tormented for years is now made whole. Jesus had the power over the demons, and only with his permission could they enter into the pigs. They, I'm telling you, these pigs were squealing for Jesus. Squealing because a man that was at one time on his way to hell because he was possessed of a demon now was set free by the blood of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ said, come on out of there and get over into them pigs. They squealed for Jesus. Squealing because this man was now going to be clothed in his right mind. Jesus is the one that makes a difference. You say, what are we going to do during this time of difficulty? I'm telling you, turn to Jesus. He's the one that makes a difference. He's the one that brings the peace. He's the one that brings that encounter like no other encounter. Amen. Colossians 1.13 says this, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. What an encounter. Amen. The question is, is are you keeping it a secret? Are you squealing for Jesus? What a time to be squealing. And finally... We see the effect. Verse 15 of Mark chapter 5. It says, They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. Verse 17 began to pray him to depart out of their coast. Now one would think that these folks would have been elated that a man that was uncontrollable, unconsolable, you know, that he was cutting, he was a vagrant, that he was a man that was tormented, angry, and intimidating, was now sitting clothed in his right mind. You would think they would be elated for him. Elated, excited, but that wasn't the case. They were afraid by what they heard, and they just wanted Jesus to leave. So with the effect, first off, we see the disturbance. The disturbance. Now I want you to think about this. These folks just saw, and if you know about the price of pigs, in my estimation, about $1,600,000 just ran off the side of the cliff. <laughs> That's a lot of money. That's a whole lot of money. You know, and here's the truth. Not everyone is going to be excited when a person comes to know Christ. Not everybody. I think to myself sometimes about when I was in Iraq years ago at a Ford operating base and had a uh, young Muslim, well, a short Muslim man, and I don't really know how old he was. And he said to me that his name was Muhammad Muhammad. Now, I had never heard such a thing, first and last name being the same. Now, I just asked him, because we had a good relationship, I asked him if I could call him Muhammad Ali. He said, no, he didn't even understand why I was asking. So I said, okay, I, I'm sorry, that was just for me. So I called him what he, his name, Muhammad Muhammad. And every day he would come in there and he was painting the inside. Uh, uh, we had a hard structure at the time of our chapel. Painting and painting, just enjoying life. And, and I would bring him Pepsis, and man, I brought him Pepsis, and he'd, he would just get after it. He just loved Pepsi. So every day he'd get two Pepsis, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And then before he left, one of the last things he painted is 
uh, we had a column, and on it we had a, this big wooden cross, and he painted a beautiful brown. So that was the first thing people saw when they came into the chapel. You know, from time to time I think about Muhammad Muhammad. And I think about the fact that in Iraq, only about 5% claimed to know Christ as their Savior. I would say this, in that land, in that country, when somebody comes to know Christ, it's a big deal. It's a great separation. It, you, know, you, know, you don't have to go too far back in history to see in, there's some countries when somebody comes forward and says, hey, I know Christ is my Savior, that the whole family then shuns them. It's a great disturbance. But here, where we are in America, maybe we don't have the same threat of becoming a Christian as they do in, in some of these places. But when an adult or anyone comes to know Christ, they can still sometimes face that persecution, still face that where their family maybe doesn't want anything to do with them. They don't understand what it is and the fact that you don't want to, your buddies don't want to go out and they don't want you to tell them about Jesus and you don't want to go out and do the things that they're wanting to do like you used to do. Because now your, your life is for Christ. And they don't understand that. Well, let me just encourage you a little bit. It's hard, it's hard to soar like an eagle when you're hanging out with buzzards. <laughs> so sometimes you just need to separate it and hang out with your, your new family. Those that know Christ as their Savior. Those that can be an encouragement to you. It's a time to be an encouragement for us that know Christ. And finally, when it comes to the effect, we see the difference. They come to Jesus. Verse 15, they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Then the man that was possessed said that, hey, he wanted to follow Jesus. But Jesus says, no, go back to your family. Go back to your family. Verse 20 says, and he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now, I thought to myself, what a sad case that Jesus went all this way, and there he was to, to bring salvation, and all those folks saw a great thing happen, and they said, get out of here. Get out of here. I said, oh, man, they're going to lose that witness. But wait a minute. No, wait a minute. They got, the, they got a great witness. Because the Bible says that everybody in that area knew about this man. Everybody in that area knew. Nobody wanted to go by that way. And now that man that had that previous testimony, if you will, of being possessed of the demon, cutting and, and threatening, was now testifying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, yes. To me, that's a good witness. That's a good witness. And the Bible says that all men did marvel. So they knew who he used to be. But praise God, they see who he is now. And I want you to think of what, one more thing when it comes to being a witness. Jesus and his disciples went all that way, went through all that storm, all the way to the gatherings and, and dealt with that man. And, and I believe if you read Matthew's account, at the minimum of two men, I would say, possibly there. And Jesus is one that, that sent them over there because he's one that said, let us pass over to the other side. All that way, and only two men. And mathematical equation doesn't seem like much that two men came to know Christ. All that direction, all that distance. And what I'm telling you is this. Jesus made a difference in their lives, those two men that day. During this difficult time when we're separating or social distancing, if you will, you can still make a difference. Christ is still the answer. He is the one that brings peace that passeth all understanding. He is the one that people need to hear about. Oh, that we would share Christ with others during this time and give them the peace that we know so dearly. So the question is, is are you keeping a secret? Are you squealing for Jesus? 
Well, this morning, I hope you see that you can have an enjoyable time witnessing for Jesus by managing your expectations when it comes to the effort, the encounter, and the effect. As the, pianist, excuse me, as the guitarist begins to play, let me ask you just a few questions. Please be praying with me. Are you willing to go whatever distance that God would have you to go to share the gospel? We're facing some difficult times here. Are you willing to share, still share Christ with others? Remember, Jesus is in your ship. He's with you. You're not alone. The question is, is will you let it draw you closer or further away from God, those difficulties? Secondly, what about the people God wants you to tell about Him? Proverbs 23, 17 says, Let not thy heart envy sinners, but be thou the fear of the Lord all the day long. Maybe the folks we see look like they have everything they want, but hear me when I say this. They may not have the most important thing of all. They may not have Christ as their Savior. And finally, let God use you. Before long, you will see the difference it makes in that person that you shared Christ with when they come up to you and tell you that, hey, thank you. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Thank you for sharing Jesus. Is that a secret? Or are you squealing? God, thank you for this time we've had here. We do pray that you continue to work in the minds and the hearts to encourage others. The cause of Christ. What an opportune time to share the hope that passes all understanding. That peace that we have deep inside. Help us to be used of you in whatever way it looks like. Be with the pastors chaplains all across this globe as we're trying to do our part to share the good news, the gospel message. For this offer is my prayer in Jesus' name. He has mercy 
and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Thank you for joining us here at Camp Lejeune Area Service. We pray that the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart today. We pray that you continue to be a witness for our Lord. Let God use you in whatever way he sees fit. Thank you for joining us today. Amen.